Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I'm fascinated by a question, and I know I'm not the only one. And that question is, what should economies be aimed at? I mean, if you were in charge of a country's economy, where would you be trying to take it? Or if indeed you had to give the impression of being in charge of a country's economy, what would you be trying to deliver with it? Well, I studied economics at university 20 years ago, and we never actually asked that question, even though it seems like a very fundamental one, because the answer was a given. It was economic growth. We were aiming to generate economic growth in the way we were studying and modeling economies. Since 1970, it's quadrupled. And if you believe mainstream predictions, which it's hard to do in the current atmosphere, but if you do, it's set to quadruple again by 2050 on the global scale. So economic growth has been doing very nicely in the long-term big picture. And yet, there are some things that we fundamentally care about that aren't coming along with it. And there are three I want to highlight. One, deprivation. Secondly, degradation. And thirdly, inequality. More and more social commentators are talking about the rise of inequality and the importance of tackling it. Two thirds of the world's population today live in countries that are now more unequal than they were in 1980. And just taking one country as an example, in 2010, the top richest 10% of people in the United States captured 93% of the increase in national income that year. So inequality is really quite extraordinarily at the heart of the way economies are growing. Our politicians know it. We're hung up on talking about economic growth, but because they know that we need more than this, this one lever doesn't really capture everything we care about, they're increasingly trying to qualify what they're calling for with, with extra terms. So uh, Merkel has called for sustainable growth, David Cameron for balanced growth, Barack Obama for long-term lasting growth. Barroso wants the EU to have smart, sustainable, inclusive, and resilient growth. And all these terms, I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm walking into a New York deli bar. <laughs> and what kind of growth do you want today? You can have it balanced and equitable, add in some good. You want it green? Maybe that seems too hard, just a bit greener. You know, so many different terms are being added to this idea. It's clear that we want something more than growth. The fact that we want something more than growth, though, shouldn't seem like news. Because when the very idea of national income and its growth was conceived, its inventor warned us that we needed something more than that. In 1934, when Simon Kuznets wrote the first report to the US Congress describing how you could measure national income, he said that the wealth of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measure of its national income. He gave us that caveat on day one. But it's as if we just tuck that quietly aside and carried on with the obsession on, on economic growth, GDP growth itself. So 75 years later, two Nobel Prize winning economists, Amartya Sen and Joseph Stiglitz, brought together an assemblage of, of top economic thinkers to have a good hard look at GDP and our, our focus on national income. And they said, those attempting to guide the economy in our societies are like a pilot trying to steer without a reliable compass. We're still there. And no wonder our politicians are searching, grasping for the language that they need to describe where we're trying to go, because growth isn't enough as an idea of what we're trying to achieve. So what would it look like if we actually tried to come up with the kind of compass that we could put in their hands and give them something to steer the economy with? What if we could actually help politicians get away from the very short-term thinking about the next three months of GDP outcomes, is it going up or down? And just get away from that short-termism and go to the long-term. So if we're gonna to go to the long-term, let's go to the really, really long-term and look at the last 100,000 years of the planet and its temperature. And what you can see here is that the temperature of the planet has varied incredibly. And yet the last 10 to 12,000 years have been remarkably relatively stable compared to all of that other history. And that last 10 to 12,000 years is the geological era known as the Holocene. It's no coincidence that we began agriculture in this era. It's no coincidence that humanity began to master the resources that we had around us 
because this has been an extraordinarily benevolent period of the planet's history for humanity. And so we need to say, well, what is it about this period that's made it so benevolent for us? And that's exactly what Johan Rockström of the Stockholm Resilience Center did. He said, hang on, what is it about the Holocene? What are the critical Earth system processes we need to hold on to to keep ourselves in this extraordinarily benevolent phase of the planet's history? And just stepping back a minute, that's, it's fascinating that that's almost the first time someone's asked the question like that. Because we've been trying to understand how the human body works since the 14th century. Trying to understand the limits of how high a temperature can go before you collapse. How fast the heart can beat. How long you can go without water. We understand the limits of our bodies. It's now the 21st century scientists are trying to understand the limits of pressure that humanity can put on planet Earth before we push it out of this state that sustains us. So Rockström and his fellow scientists came up with a set of nine boundaries that they call the nine planetary boundaries. And they said, if we can keep humanity's pressure on the planet within sustainable limits on these boundaries so that we don't push ourselves into tipping points, push these processes over the edge so that they change catastrophically, then we'll be in a safe space for humanity. So we mustn't put so much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that we cause catastrophic climate change change the world's rivers and waters, diverting through dams and water withdrawal so that we actually dry up riverbeds. We mustn't use so much nitrogen and phosphorus in fertilizers that we create, the runoff creates dead zones in the ocean. We mustn't, again, increase so much carbon dioxide use that the oceans acidify, killing off much of the sea life. Creating chemicals such as heavy metals or radioactive materials or persistent organic pollutants that start to change the very reproductive abilities of humanity and other animals. Loading so many aerosols into the atmosphere, sulfates and other kinds of gases that we put up, that we start to change cloud formation and move monsoon patterns and actually give ourselves lung disease from all that pollution. We mustn't put so many gases in the air that pleat the ozone layer, that we have a hole in the ozone layer that gives us skin cancer and that destroys marine and terrestrial systems. We must hang on to biodiversity because its loss makes us all the more are vulnerable to, to sudden shocks and changes. And again, land use mustn't be so changed from its original state that we create a vulnerability and lack of resilience in the planet's systems. And then they said, well, if, that's, if those are the boundaries, where are we at today in relation to those boundaries? And they tried to estimate, first estimate of where they think we are on a global scale. And what this shows us is that on at least three of them, we are over the boundary. So on climate change, we already know this. We are putting far too many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and really on the verge of causing catastrophic climate change. But also on nitrogen, they estimate we're putting three times more reactive nitrogen out in the atmosphere than the planet can sustain. And we are massively over on biodiversity loss. And on those other boundaries, though we may be below the global boundary, we know that within regions, many regions are already experiencing severe stress. So we may not have gone over the fresh water use boundary globally, but some regions live at the appalling water scarcity. Think of Lake Chad, which has shrunk to around 10% of its size over the last 30 years. Over 1 billion people live in water scarce regions already. And we're moving towards the boundaries on those, on those other areas. So they've defined this safe operating space for humanity from that standpoint. And it's really important to say at this point that this is not an environmental agenda. These boundaries have not been defined for tree frogs and for polar bears. Sure, they need them too. But these boundaries have been defined for us, for humanity, because it is these Earth system processes that keep the planet in a benevolent state for us to thrive in. We need to come back within the pressure that we're putting on those boundaries, back below the environmental ceiling. And yet still, that's only half the challenge we face. Because just as there's beyond that environmental ceiling is, lies unacceptable pressure on the environment, unacceptable resource degradation, so too, at the center, there's unacceptable human deprivation, where people lack the resources they need to meet their human rights to having health, to having enough food to eat and water, to having income, their rights to education, to be resilient in the face of shocks, to having voice in their society, to having jobs, access to energy, and to having social equity in a society and gender equality. This diagram, in a way, captures the challenge that we face in the 21st century. And that challenge is to say, how can we ensure that every human being has the resources they need to meet their human rights, but that collectively we do it within the means of this one planet?
We've defined the social boundary and an outer environmental ceiling or a planetary boundary. And our challenge is to move into that safe and just space for humanity between the two, shaped like a donut. And in the space there, that is where inclusive and sustainable economic development would take place. And just as the natural scientist said, where are we in relation to the planetary boundary? So too we can say, well, where are we in relation to that social foundation? And looking at United Nations data, we can see that we're falling far below it on every single dimension for which we can get those data together. So for example, on food, 13% of people in the world don't have enough food to eat. 19% of people in the world live without access to electricity. Indeed, millions of people around the world still live with the most fundamental deprivations of access to resources to meet their human rights. Far below the social foundation, while collectively we've already gone over at least three of the planetary boundaries. We're outside this donut on both sides, and I think that's an indictment of the pathway that global development has taken to date, so unsustainable and so inequitable. And that's pretty depressing. So here's some good news. We could get everybody out of this level of poverty without putting pressure on the planet. What would it take to end hunger? It would take around 3% of the current global food supply, 3%. According to the International Energy Agency, they could get access to electricity to everybody in the world with just a 1% increase in global carbon emissions. That's fantastic news because it means the challenge of tackling climate change and the challenge of ending, en ending energy poverty are completely separable. So this begs the question, if we could end poverty without pushing, putting pressure on the planet, where is this pressure coming from? Well, it's coming from the other end of the global consumer base. If we look at that challenge on climate change, researchers at Princeton University estimate that around half of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are produced for just 11% of the world's population, that the richest carbon-intensive users in every country in the world. I call them the global carbonistas. And if you look at the sustainable budget that we could use on nitrogen, right now, one third of that sustainable budget is being used to grow animal feed to produce meat for Europe. So it's immediately clear that if we want to come back within the planet's boundaries, we need to transform the consumption choices and the patterns and the production patterns of the world's highest resource-using populations in every country in the world. I'm really struck by the traction this diagram has had. I drew it first time a year ago, and it's been taken up in a lot of debates. And I'm asking myself why. And I think there are three good reasons. Firstly, I think the framing of planetary boundaries is a very, very powerful one. It makes the, the complexity of Earth system science accessible to non-scientists and helps us to see the planet as a whole, as a system of interlocking processes that we depend upon for our well-being. Secondly, by putting that social foundation in the heart of it, it brings into one simple picture the world of development and the world of environment. And it helps to end the false dichotomy that we face that either you're for de development and ending poverty or you're for protecting the environment. And these are separate concerns, but they're not separate concerns because we depend upon the environment and this state of the planet for all of our well-being. And thirdly, I think people are interested in it because it gives us a chance to rethink economic development. Instead of starting with economic growth, we start with the fundamentals of what we care about. Everybody meeting their human rights, living within the means of this planet. And then we ask, what kind of economic system would help to take us there? And I think there are some changes that we clearly need to make to the way that we plan economic development. The first one would be, we need to bring a far more diverse group of people into economic decision making. We need to listen to scientists much more in terms of them telling us where those boundaries are and how close we are. Secondly, we need to bring, as well as a diverse group of thinkers, we need to bring in diverse metrics. So not just talking about economic development in terms of monetary metrics, but talking natural metrics. We've become used to talking about tons of carbon. It's, we hear it on the radio, it's in the papers. But we need to diversify and understand more of the planet's metrics, because these are the metrics that we live by. And also the social metrics, that how, how humanity is doing thinking much more at the center of our economic thinking. Are we meeting the human rights of all? And are we ensuring that we're doing this without extraordinary inequalities in our societies? And thirdly, I think it gives us a chance to rethink what is economic development? We've always assumed it was economic growth, GDP growth. Now we're facing a much more fundamental question of, is growth compatible 
with living in this safe and just space. And many people argue it is. Some people argue that we need economic growth in order to generate the investment and create the new technologies that will help take us there. Others will say the opposite. They'll say we clearly need to move beyond GDP growth in order to get here. One thing I think is definitely true, because that debate is still out there and unresolved. One thing is true. We need to widen our concept of what economic development is far beyond growth alone. So we need to think about investing in the wealth that sustains us, the human wealth, the natural wealth, and the social wealth, because it's from these that everything that we generate in our economy flows. Imagine if an image like this, a vision like this, was actually put at the heart of decision making and the way we thought about going forward with our economies. Imagine if we could each sit at a table with planetary and social boundaries and think, well, where's my life at in relation to this? What can I do in my own life that would make sure that my actions, what I buy, how I consume, what I eat, how I vote, how I travel, how I power my home, am I making sure that I'm respecting people's human rights in that process and keeping down my footprint on the planet? What if companies sat around a table and put their product at the middle of that table and asked themselves, where is this product in terms of planetary and social boundaries? How can we bring our products and our supply chains into the space that we can be proud of saying these are 21st century products because they're helping take the 21st century where we need to go? And what if the world's governments, with apologies to Dr. Strangelove, <laughs> what if the world's governments sat around a conference table and said, how can we collectively bring humanity into this space? Well, Amazingly enough, they're actually taking on that challenge right now because the world's governments are facing the, the opportunity to come up with a set of global development goals that will both ensure human rights are met and environmental sustainability. And the question is, will they be able to grasp the scale of this challenge? Will they be able to leave behind short-term national interests that we're so often locked in and look for the long-term, the collective and the global interest that we have to pursue? Can they do it on a scale commensurate with the urgency of the challenge we face? Can they, in fact, turn it into an opportunity to bring us into this safe and just space for humanity? Because if they could, that would really give us something worth aiming our economies at. Thank you very much indeed.